Uh, so good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for Zoom at Noon Conversation with the Curator. My name is Laura Santoyo. Uh, I'm the Curator of Collections for the Shingothi Center of Aurora University. Before we begin, some basic housekeeping items. This presentation is being recorded. The recording will be uploaded onto our YouTube channel and website and also shared across our social media platforms. Please keep yourself muted for the full length of the presentation so that we can hear the speaker without background noise or interruptions. If you do have a question for our speaker, please drop your question into the Q&A box. Your question will be answered after the presentation if time allows. Our current exhibition, Global Language of Headwear, Cultural Identity, Rites of Passage and Spirituality is available to view online. Just visit our website and click on the Virtual Experiences tab. Now I'm turning things over to Dr. Natasha Ritzma, Director of the Shingothi Center. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, well, today I am thrilled to introduce Stacy Miller, the curator of our current exhibition. Stacy Miller is the owner of Hat Horizons and an independent curator of ethnographic headwear. She has spent over 30 years collecting and researching the cultural significance of hats and headdresses. Since 2000, she has delivered educational programs, lectured, hosted special events, and curated numerous exhibitions based on her collection. Today, her collection has grown to more than 1,300 hats and headdresses from almost every corner of the world. Her long-term vision is to establish a museum of world cultures as a way to promote cross-cultural interest and understanding. So I'm very excited to start this conversation today. And my first question for Stacy is if she could tell us the origin story of her collection, how she started collecting hats and why. Stacy, I believe you're muted. Sorry about that. Okay. Oh, no worries. Um, so I don't think of myself as being a collector or an acquirer of things in general. So it sort of surprises me to look back and see a, um, all the hats that I've collected and a household filled with hats and headdresses. But uh, I really started collecting by mistake. It was never an intentional thing to do, but I, uh, Oh, years ago, I had an opportunity to live with a um, family in Spain. And after college, I always loved to travel and I've always enjoyed learning other languages. So after college, when this opportunity came, I thought, oh, perfect, this would be a great thing to do. And I'll go and spend several months and teach myself some Spanish. So I arrived in a sleepy little town in Andalusia, armed with dictionaries and workbooks. And I get up every morning and translate a, an article in a newspaper or a magazine. And one day it was a short advertisement that I happened to see and translate. And it was for a man in Madrid who was looking for people to accompany him on a trip for, driving from Spain to India. So an overland trip in a um, pretty remote part of the world. And I got the information and I think I've been probably in Spain maybe a month at that point, but I left there, left Spain and set off with a group of 22 Spaniards, none of whom I could actually talk to at that time, at that point in time. And um, we were driving in a reconfigured school bus. So we're really traveling sort of like gypsies. This was definitely a low budget, um, uh, a low budget um, excursion for us. But we arrived about a week later in Istanbul. And this was in the like 1979, 1980. Um, you know, at, a, at that point, Americans for the most part had stopped um, wearing hats. So I woke up in the bus the next morning, we were parked in on a main square. And I was just so startled to see a sea of skull caps walking by um, the bus uh, outside of the windows. And all the men in Turkey at that point were wearing skull caps. And we were seeing many of them because we were parked very close to the Sultanahmet Mosque which is a tourist attraction, but it's also a place of worship for the Muslim men in, in, in that community. And all the men were going to say their morning prayers. So the, I was sort of intrigued by seeing all these men with these um, decorative skull caps. And for about 25 cents outside of the mosque later that day, I bought my first hat. And that's the one you see on your screen. It's a very simple um, white skull cap with just cotton with a little bit of embroidery on it. 
it pro it cost me nothing and it was a perfect souvenir that's really why i bought it it was um, something i could jam in the bottom of my backpack but it was also very evocative of the culture um, that i was experiencing there so so it was really a perfect souvenir just a nice little remembrance Little did I know that 1300, 1300 hats later, <laughs> that that's what it would evolve to. But um, but the inspiration um, for my hat collecting is really the revelation that hats aren't something that you just wear, as we do in our society for the most part. We put them on if it's cold, if it's rainy, if we want to keep um, the sun off our faces. But um, but people wear them um, as a way of sending in, in other parts of the world, the, the hats are really very, very significant. Um, and I learned as I traveled on this trip east from east from Europe all the way to India, that every day people, we'd see people wearing very different styles of hats. Um, so that's really what intrigued me um, and sort of got the collection started. Wonderful. Um, so on the screen now, we have a variety of hats that our audience is very familiar <laughs> with. And um, I was wondering if you could talk about how um, the hats we use in our everyday lives and to mark occasions and holidays <laughs> and um, how they um, connect to your exhibition. So the thing that intrigues me about the hats is the insights that they offer into the cultures that they come from and also individually to the people who, who wear the hats. And so it's easy to look out at, for the hats, for instance, that are in the exhibition and see some things that are very unusual and look very foreign to our eyes. But we sort of forget that we also have hats. And I think in particular, we forget that the hats might actually say something about who we are and where we fit into our society. So I like to remind people that um, the hats also give us some perspective on our culture as well, not just about not just learning about other cultures. Um, baseball caps, um, of which I have two here, are you know are ubiquitous. So we tend not to think much about them. We sort of take them for granted. They're popular, they're very practical, but they also give us a perspective on who we are. So the John Deere cap, I, I always like to hold out as sort of an um, indicator of where a person might live, what kind of work they do. Uh, you know, it's typically worn by farmers in the Midwest, although you see people a lot on lawn um, tractors and so forth, but it also, that hat makes a statement about who that person is. Um, just like the, um, I guess it's the oh, White Sox in Chicago. Um, you know, a, a hat we, we forget will also often tell people where we come from, what community we belong to, in the sense of sort of identifying favorite sports teams. Uh, it might tell, indicate to people where we went to school, where we go on vacation. So the hats in subtle ways, or maybe perhaps not so subtle ways, send messages about where we fit in. Um, the cowboy hat is interesting because it's a hat that is really very unique to the United States. You could take it almost anywhere and people would recognize it and associate it with the United States and a part of our history of sort of the cowboys and Indians, which is really unique. I'm always, you know, I'm, you know when I travel, um, you know, people are always familiar with Westerns and John Wayne and they, they understand the association that that particular hat has with with our culture and with our history you know the sort of the whole westward expansion and it also symbolizes uh, a cowboy who i think in most people's minds is very self-reliant and independent so again it, it has a lot of meaning in that sense the um you have also up there a graduation hat uh, which which represents in many ways a rites of passage for american students and a lot of the hats that I have in my collection and several that are in the exhibition, and I can think of one in particular from Africa that is used really in almost the same way. Again, different cultural um, concept, but it's the idea of um, identifying a person's transition typically from childhood into adulthood, which is what the graduation cap does, and then often from adulthood into being a married person. And a lot of societies have all of those hats that represent all of those transitions and, and different stages in a person's life. 
Um, the Santa hat is, is interesting. Again, it's a hat that is sort of very symbolic. And I think when kids see it, they think of this magical person who's going to bring them presents and so forth. And many of the hats that I have on exhibition are hats that also have magical qualities in a sense. They are going to, you know, they are going to, you know, bring good things to that person. They will, um, some, many of the hats will scare spirits away, but also they have auspicious powers. And I think if you asked any little kid at Christmas time, the significance of the hat, they would, you know, they would be very excited and happy because of what that symbolizes. Great. So, um, we have over, we have 88 hats on view from your collection. And um, in preparing for this conversation, I asked you which hats were the most meaningful to you. So I'm gonna mm -hmm. share okay. some images and ask you to tell us why these particular hats are the most meaningful to you. Okay, it was, it was sort of hard to pick which ones, but this hat is, is um, important to me and meaningful because it was one of the first hats I think that I bought when I was not actually traveling overseas. So it wasn't something that I found um, in a local market, but it was a hat. I was driving actually from New Jersey to Kansas City. We stopped in, in Pittsburgh and went to the Carnegie Mellon Museum. And this was a hat in their museum shop that was being deaccessioned by the museum itself. So I was able to, to bargain the uh, shopkeeper down and was thrilled with my new acquisition, but I really didn't know much about it. And at that point I was sort of starting off, I just had a random collection of hats that I picked up typically as souvenirs, um, but I was in Kansas City at the time and so curious about the hat that I picked up the phone and called somebody at their local museum, the Nelson Atkins, to see if anybody would, there would be able to give me some information about the hat. And they have a, a wonderful collection of African, of African art and the curator there um, offered to spend some time with me. So I brought him the hat and he looked at it and was pretty impressed by, by um, this hat, particularly because of the writing on it. So he was familiar with it, um, told me a little bit about it, but he also um, introduced me to a book called The Power of Headdress, which among hat collectors is sort of the Bible of hats. And it was the first time I realized that there were actually there were resources and, and places where I could get more information and further my knowledge about the hats. So it's meaningful to me in, um, in the sense that it really sort of kickstarted the, um, the collection for me in terms of getting more information about the, all the pieces. Great. Can you tell us a little bit about this hat? Ah, so this is a hat from the Philippines. It's a gourd hat that's known as a tabangal, and it's a very recent acquisition. But this hat, as simple as it is, is meaningful to me because of the personal connection of how I came to acquire it. So I was, this was a, I was working on the exhibition um, late one night do, doing some research and trying to understand where these hats came from, um, how they were worn and so forth. And I was looking up gourd hats from the Philippines and found an article um, about a hat maker in the northern part of the Philippines who had been named a national living treasure, which used to be a UNESCO designation. And this particular article had a byline from the author which, and, and a, um, an email address for him. So that night I sent him an email told, ask, asking him where I could, if he had any idea where I could find this man, Teofilo Garcia, and um, obtain one of these hats. Because I decided, I saw this, it's like, I have to have one of these in my collection. So um, he wrote back immediately with the instructions to friend on Facebook, a man named George Leland. So before shutting off my computer that night, I sent George a Facebook friend request and went to bed. And the next morning, a few hours later, I got up and I had messages from George saying that he had already spoken to Teofilo and had ordered a hat for me. So I was just amazed at how quickly all this took place and how responsive people were. Um, so he kept me, so I, I would periodically, like maybe every week or so, um, get a, an 
a message from George giving me an update on the hat. And these are in the one picture, well, you see the finished hat. The other picture are all the gourds that Teofilo has collected. And I think that's the beginning of my hat sitting on top of them because they started this, this, um, this right away. So um, I got um, periodic updates on the, on the status of the hat. And um, there's some pictures of um, the man making it and so forth. So this is a community um, in the northern part, a fairly isolated part, I gather, of the Philippines. And they were just thrilled that I had reached out to them and wanted a hat. And I had told them sort of as extra incentive to let them know that I was serious about um, obtaining this hat, that it was going to be in a museum exhibition in the United States. Well, they were very, very proud, proud of that. Um, so you can see the pictures of Teofilo working on the hat and, and signing it for me. Um, once it was done, uh, probably a couple months later, um, came the question of how I was actually going to get this hat. And the hat itself wasn't very expensive, but, but shipping it to the United States was probably three or four times the original price of the hat. So um, George, my, my new Facebook friend, put out on social media a request to see if anybody in you know, his community was going to be traveling to either New York or Canada and would be willing to carry this hat for me. And sure enough, somebody, um, somebody actually signed up her, a woman in Canada signed up her mother who was coming to visit her. And um, she ended up bringing the hat I don't know how many airports she had to travel to to uh, get it to me, but she was this tiny woman with this big bulky package that she was so kind to to deliver to her family. And I went up to Toronto I, again. I friended um, Joe via the um, the woman and uh, again a, another new Facebook friend, and we arranged for me to pick it up in Toronto. And when I arrived at her apartment, she had this wonderful spread of food and had invited friends and family over um, to you know, to meet me. So it was just a wonderful experience. And um, it, the hat is special um, because of the human connections I made, but also just a reflection of the goodness and the generosity and the enthusiasm of all the people who helped get this hat to me. And it was really fun to see the community so excited and so proud about sharing this hat with the rest of the world. Great. Oops. Can you tell me a little bit about this hat yes. and why it's meaningful? So this hat is meaningful less because of the personal connection, but because this is a hat that is filled with lots of meaning for the people who wear it. Um, it comes from the northern part of Thailand in an area that's known for having different hill tribes. And each of the six hill tribes has its own language, religion, culture, crafts, and so forth. And the women who wear these headdresses, which are they look ceremonial because they're so ornate and ostentatious, but they're actually, or had been at least, worn for everyday purposes. But um, the Aka tribe, uh, the women in the Aka tribe wear these very elaborate headdresses, and it identifies the woman as being from the Aka community, so a shared language, um, a shared sort of history and values and so forth. Um, it also identifies her, the clan or the community she belongs to. So this is worn by a woman from the um, Fami clan. And it's also important because um, this kind of headdress represents a transition um, to different stages of life. So it's a hat that only young women when they become engaged are allowed to wear and they would wear it as a married woman. So it sort of represents her status as being a, um, a married woman and a mother, and also because of the materials on it, it would indicate her, her relative wealth in the community. It has lots of coins, little pieces of silver and so forth. So the more ornate the hat, the better quality materials um, would indicate sort of what her wherewithal, sort of the way we do, but we don't wear hats to do that. We buy, we have the, you know, we can go into a shop and buy things that, that are branded in a certain way. So this is sort of the same sense of, of branding a person and where they fit in. Great. Can you talk about this hat? And so this hat um, is, is sort of connected to the, to the previous hat, to the, to the woman's headdress, mm -hmm. um, but it represents again, the transition and the importance of hats in, in the Aka community in terms of giving them meaning about um, 
your or representing meaning about who they are and where they fit into to their communities. This is a hat that would be worn by by a young Aka child, either I think either a, a small boy or girl. And the children, when they're young, will wear these hats. They're sort of a, just a simple cotton hat. Each year, the parents or the mother would add a little more ornamentation to the hat to, in, in a sense, you know, as we might celebrate a birthday. And the boys eventually stop wearing the hats. The girls um, will transition eventually into a woman wearing a woman's headdress. So again, it represents a different stage in, in a person's life. So you can see a whole family of people from an Aka um, uh, community there. And on the other side of your screen, you'll see the variety of Aka headdresses that these women wear. So you see the one that I had spoken about previously on the top, but the other four represent um, the different Aka clans or communities. So people in, in that area can tell exactly where, where this woman is from. So it sends an immediate message um, about the person wearing it. Great. And my next question is, how do you find your hats? And can you tell us a little <laughs> bit about your criteria for determining whether you would like to um, add a hat to your collection? always want to add hats, although I've got so many, I'm sort of reluctant to add any hats anymore. But um, so my collecting definitely is slowing down. But I find hats everywhere. And the internet has really just opened up a, a whole new world in terms of um, the ability to acquire pieces. So maybe I should blame the internet for having like 1300 hats. But um, my criteria basically, well, my criteria has changed. When I first started collecting hats, I was not terribly discriminatory. It was, um, you know, it was a hat and it looked sort of unusual and interesting um, and was within the right price range. I'd buy it and then take it home and figure out what I was going to do with it or what I could learn about it. Um, the, the hats I started to acquire really when I traveled. And as I said, I love to travel. So uh, it wasn't something I, you know, it's funny, I'd be in a place and, and just stumble upon a local market where where people were wearing hats or maybe they had old hats they that they no longer um, wore or were really part of their tradition. So typically that's where I started finding hats. Um, I've also gotten much better at it. When, when I travel, I would just sort of randomly be pleased when I found a, a local vendor. But now when I travel, I've done some research, I have a list of questions, I have pictures of the pieces that I'm looking for. So I've gotten much more um, diligent about um, being, you know, looking for specific pieces. But I've also found that when I travel, um, asking about something unusual, like a traditional piece of headwear or a hat has opened up all kinds of doors for me. And I've, I've had experiences like in a market in India, I had a hat that I was looking for and showed it to somebody who I thought might have something similar that he or she was selling. And that person took the piece of paper to another person who took it to another person. And the next thing, there's a whole group of people congregated um, around my picture of a hat that I was looking for, passing it around and discussing it. And then they all disappeared. And one man came back to me and said, here, follow me. And I had no idea where we were going. But we, um, we walked through local neighborhoods that as a typical tourist, I would never have set foot in. And um, I don't know, in and out. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, is this, you know, where am I going? Am I ever going to find my way back? But he ended up leading me to a store that um, that happened to have the hat exactly the hat that I wanted. So I've, it's just really opened up doors in terms of um, my interaction with with local people when I've traveled, which has been very very special. Right. Uh, so that hat, the hat that's on the screen now, I actually bought on eBay, and it was one of um, it was an early eBay acquisition. It um, I, to my amazement, it was being sold by a woman in Yemen. And I bought it and again, eBay was pretty new. I wasn't sure what to expect, but a couple of weeks later, the package arrived with this hat in it. The package itself was literally covered the entire thing, except the address with stamps from Yemen and voila, there was my hat. So it was just sort of a, came from a long way. It was just a very surprising, you know, surprising uh, experience. And can you talk a little bit about this one as well? Well, this is a hat, a little bonnet from uh, Slovakia. 
And I was traveling with a group of people, um, a woman who had spent who was sort of leading this group had spent a lot of time and had many, many connections um, throughout Slovakia, but particularly in, in a lot of the rural communities. So we were, oh, I can't even remember um, exactly what town we were in, but this was an older woman uh, that she knew. And, um, you know, we were just welcomed into this woman's home and I had asked if there were any hats or pieces of costume that she had. And she goes into another room, pulls out a big old wooden trunk and started taking pieces out. And, and there were things that uh, I think she had a wedding dress that as a young woman she had worn. She had hats that had belonged to her and her family. And she had very, very carefully and tenderly stored all these things away because for the most part, um, they're not worn anymore. But she had saved them and I was able to buy a couple of hats from her. Great. And um, my next question, Piggying back on this one is, could you tell us which hats are have been the most difficult to find and the story behind this one? Well, some of the hats that have been the hardest to find are ones that 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 at least I would think should not be that difficult to acquire. You know, they're places that they're not like tribal communities that I'm never ever going to uh, to get to. Um, but typically, they're hats that. Um, I don't know why they're just kind of tucked away, hidden away. So this is a, a, a Shinto priest's hat from Japan. And I love it because I just love the sculptural design of it and the delicateness with which it's, it's um, woven. I think it's the, the little tail and back is very, very finely woven silk. Um, but it's a hat that is very, you know, if you see pictures of Japanese people at, at any of their shrines, you'll see, often see the Shinto priests wearing this. So I sort of had a hankering for one of these hats. Never, almost never find anything online or at tribal art fairs or, or auctions um, of Japanese pieces. But I was traveling with in Japan with my mother a number of years ago, and we were in Kyoto. And I, I probably made a pest of myself asking our tour guide if she had any idea where I could get one of these hats. And finally, uh, she took me to a religious supply store in Kyoto. And um, I don't know how I, how I, she must have translated, but we, I was finally able to get them to bring out this hat and they were willing to sell it to me. But also in Japan, there's um, the, the language um, differences tend to be hard. A lot of Japanese don't speak English. I don't speak a word of Japanese. And so it was really, really hard to communicate what I wanted and how to pay for it and so forth. But I was thrilled when I got it. But it, it, again, it, it took some perseverance. <laughs> And I think you also have a story about this hat. As this well. hat too was one of those surprising things that I was just like, when am I ever gonna find an authentic Sami hat from Norway? And um, as I was curating this exhibition, I knew I wanted a balance of different countries and I wanted to include hats that were not tribal hats and looked really exotic um, to us, but, but were hats that we might be familiar with either because of the country or because we've um, seen something similar before. This is a hat from Norway, from the very northern part where there's a group of people called the Sami, or they used to be known as the Laplanders, but they have, um, and they still for special occasions continue to wear their traditional clothing. And I had, when I was curating the exhibition, I had, um, two Sami hats, a woman's bonnet and this four winds hat that I wanted to include. But as I did research, I realized that, that the hats were tourist pieces that I had been given as gifts. And I didn't really, I really wanted to include obviously something better than, than a tourist piece that anybody could pick up. So I was unable to find anything in, you know, on, on eBay or just for sale on the internet. And so as I dug deeper and deeper, I started reaching out to, you know, small little local museums in some of the Sami communities in Norway and would write to them telling them why I wanted the hat and what I was going to do with it. And I got some responses, but they didn't lead anywhere. But, oh my gosh, I'd probably been working on this on and off for a year or so. And, and time was running short because I was, was getting close to packing up the hats and getting them all ready for the, for the exhibition. And somebody 
wrote back and told me to go to Facebook Marketplace. And, and she gave me the, the name of the of what I had to input, totally unpronounceable name, but I, I entered it and ended up in a Facebook Marketplace that served the local Sami community way up north in Norway. And um, most of the people were selling just ordinary, you know, everyday stuff. But every once in a while, I'd see somebody who had hats that had belonged, you know, been worn in their family by a family member or for some some kind of occasion that they were selling. The, the problem with finding these hats is that most of the people there were communicating in the local Sami language. And so I would, you know, write in English saying, I'm interested. Can I, you know, I want to buy this hat. And they would write back in Sami and Google Translate does not recognize the Sami language. So I was just like, I was sort of getting nowhere. And then I ended up finding a woman who I think she may have had a hat to sell or, or something. And anyway, she was nice enough and pretty much offered to help me acquire these hats and told me that her aunt made the um, for for people in the community, the women's bonnets, and she knew somebody who who made these hats. So, um, so I sort of offered to or she offered to work with me, and she went. She made all the arrangements and um, went into these two different towns and bought the hats for me, packed them up, and sent them to me. So she was just extraordinarily nice uh, to do this for me. So I was really thrilled. But again, this, this hat took a lot of persistence, um, to, to finally get it there. Great. Um, so I know you have over 1300 hats in your collection already mm -hmm. that, um, I had asked you, um, uh, which hats do you still have on your wish list that you don't yet have for your collection that you would like? And can you tell us why you're interested in still acquiring? Sure. Well, um, this hat is, is something that I'd love to acquire. I actually have that strange looking black wig that is on the woman's head. Um, it's, I have no idea how it's constructed. It's probably some kind of animal hair that's glued together and it's used to represent horns. That is a piece that I had bought at a museum shop in Mongolia. And but this was before I was really familiar with some of these hats. Um, this is a traditional headdress that would have been worn by a Mongolian Kalka, which is the name of the clan that she belonged to, um, woman, um, sort of an upper class um, woman um, within their, their community. And anyway, I had bought this, the, the black wig piece not knowing that it came with all these other intricate pieces. And I love the piece because it's just so unusual and so intricate. So I would be thrilled if I found the, the um, barrettes, the, the clips, the wide clips that are on it and all the other pieces of jewelry that are draped down the ends. And then this, this, this headdress is worn with a sort of a silver filigree um, cap on the top, and then that's often topped with another hat that you see her wearing. So it's very unusual, again, hard to find, um, but I just, it's, it's a very intriguing piece. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about this one and why you're interested in trying to acquire? Hat? Oh, sort of my, my wish list. I actually had an opportunity to buy one of these hats and it was just well beyond it. You know, everything's a trade-off for me. Do I buy a hat or do I get to travel to a place? So, so this was a value to probably what I would spend on two, two um, exotic trips somewhere. Um, it is a Tibetan, um, well, Tibetan, it could be from Nepal or also from Bhutan, um, countries in which there's a strong Tibetan Buddhist um, tradition. It's a tantric crown that would have been worn or would be worn by a very high priest or, or monk um, within the, the Tibetan community. And it's just, they're beautifully made. They're silver and inlay and, um, you know, have all these sort of exotic um, features to them. But um, it's, a it's a piece that I would love to acquire someday. It's just, to, to me, it's beautiful and very unusual. And then this is another one I think you're also interested in, in trying to get a hold of. Who wouldn't, who wouldn't want a hat like that in their house? It's like a piece of sculpture. Um, it is worn by, or used to be worn by uh, taxi driver, driver, or no, so not taxi, rickshaw drivers in Durban, South Africa. And 
you know, it's just this really elaborate piece. I'd seen one years and years ago in a shop um, where the proprietor of the shop actually owned this hat and, and was unwilling to sell it, at least at that point. Um, but they're just very intricately beaded um, object d'art. You know, I, I don't know. They're just they're just wild. Of course, if I had it, I had no idea where I would put it. But I, I loved the... Um, Many of the cultures in or uh, um, ethnic groups in South Africa do do really magnificent beadwork, and this has some beautiful beadwork on it, which is part of the attraction for me. Great. So this is a um, picture of a girl from Guatemala wearing a um, a hat that I don't, and I don't have anything like this. It's um, I have very few things from Central America, so that's one of my sort of incentives um, for for um, finding a hat like this. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, for me, it would be filling in a gap geographically in terms of hat, you know, a location or an area of the world that's not well represented in my collection. And the people who wear this hat are, I don't know their sort of the ethnic name, but they're um, considered to be descendants of the Maya civilization. And um, it's a hat that's, it's sort of a turban and it's just pieces of cloth that are wrapped around and around and around with, um, I imagine, some, some very intricate embroidery along the outer edges. So, oh, another thing high on my wish list I'll probably never get is this Tibetan headdress. And um, again, these are, are very rare, um, hard to find. It's um, a woman's headdress, sort of similar to the uh, headdress from Bhutan that had the, the black wig with the horns on it. Uh, this is a hat that also represents, I think, sheep's horns or maybe yak, I don't know, some, some kind of animal horns. But it's, again, it's very intricate and unusual um, with pieces of turquoise and, and uh, coral. And I probably want it because it's just so hard to find. <laughs> and this is a funny little piece that hopefully, this, this is one that, that stands a chance of uh, being added to my collection. It's called a... Huang, and it's a little, I think it's called a coronet that is worn by women in Korea. And it, it's not worn today, but it's part of um, a traditional ceremony such as a, I think a woman, for instance, might wear it to a wedding. Um, but it's, I'm not sure, I guess it's on a little um, um, strap that, that attaches to your head, but there's something sort of, I don't know, cute and fetching about it. <laughs> So again, I, I have one other hat from Korea, but nothing, nothing like this. Great. And another question I had for you was, which hat in your collection tends to get um, the strongest reaction from people visiting the exhibition? And you mentioned well, this, that. Well, this is one that, that I think people have a very strong response to. It's a hat um, that comes from Bhutan, which is a literally a little kingdom in the Himalayan mountains that's wedged between uh, China to the north and India to the south. And it's really um, been able to maintain its, its a very unique culture. But it, it has lots of um, influence of, from Tibetan Buddhism. And this is a, a hat, a ceremonial hat that would be worn by monks in a monastery um, for something for a ceremony called the Black Hat Dance. And, you know, I think visually it's intriguing. It's got this big wide brim and then that tall thing, it's got the this, uh, sort of gold, um, delicate gold things and um, coming off the sides and a fancy peacock top to it. And it has a sort of a ghostly um, skull on the top, which I think is often startling, startling to us. But it has a lot of, visually it has a lot of interesting things going on. Um, it's, you know, the ceremony itself, um, I think is very colorful and beautiful. And we might look at it and think it's kind of a foreboding hat or a macabre hat because of the skull, but it's actually a, a hat that's worn for auspicious reasons. And the monks would wear this um, during this particular dance as a way of cleansing either the temple or the monastery of evil spirits and sort of purifying it. So it's sort of it's sort of a purifying ceremony, um, you know, so, so for, to bring good spirits um, into it. And you know, so it's not really related to death, although the it, a lot of the symbolism in Tibetan Buddhism um, frequently in, includes a skull, which is a way of reminding people of the of 
sort of the shortness and impermanence of life. So in, in a sense, it's an, a, a, you know, a welcome reminder to all of us that we, to live our lives really well because they're not going to last long. It's also, um, while it doesn't really fit into American culture, it's something, it's a, in sort of an icon that many Americans are familiar with because of the uh, Mexican celebration, the Day of the Dead, which is um, a ceremony, I can't remember when it takes place, I think in the fall, but a way, again, not a, not a bad occasion or a negative thing, but one which honors, um, honors and celebrates um, ancestors and friends and family who have passed away. Great. So this is a question I'm sure you get all the time, um, which are, some of your favorite hats in your collection? So your most beloved hats. Well, I mentioned um, earlier that I, I love my feathered hats and beaded hats. <laughs> and I think they're just beautiful. This is one of my favorite hats. It's, um, I think the colors, the vibrant color feathers are remarkable. I mean, we, we don't typically see um, birds, you know, in North America that are as brightly colored as this. So that always catches my eye. And I think it's also a very elegant just, um, design. It's very simple, but, you know, it's, you know, color wise, it's got a lot going on. Um, it's also interesting just because of the symbolism. And, and this hat is a sort of reflection. It's comes from Brazil, it's worn by people from a particular um, tribe among the Capo people. And it, it's this headdress is really a reflection of their whole view of the cosmos of, um, they believe that their ancestors descended from heaven or the sky, which is represented by the feathers onto earth. And one of the questions I get about this hat is how do you wear this thing with this little stick at the bottom? And it's worn, um, the people would take, you have seen this picture, a beeswax crown that they form around their heads, and then the, the stick is inserted into it. So it's unusual. It doesn't really look like a regular hat that you put on your head, but but I, but I do. I, I love the feathers and, and beadwork. Not, not beadwork in this, but in others. Great. So um, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time, but there is a hat I really wanted you to talk about um, that I find very interesting okay. that I know you have an interesting background story on. So, so this is a hat um, from the Yoruban tribe in Nigeria, in Africa. And most people recognize this as a barrister or a lawyer's wig from London, or the, the powdered wigs that, um, that they, I guess, still wear to represent the kind of work they do. And I thought this was hat, hat was fascinating. Again, I, I love the beadwork on it, um, but it's so startling to see an iconic image from Great Britain in Africa. And what I learned from this hat is that Nigeria was a colon, a British colony until 1960. And I think it, it just speaks to the influence of colon, you know, colonialism in Africa. Um, you know, and, and anyway, the, the, the legacy that the British left there. Yeah. Um, can you also talk a little bit about this hat? Yep. So this is from, from Bolivia. It's called, it's worn by people from the Tarabuco um, group, a, you know, a, a community um, from there. And the interesting thing about this hat is that they believe that the shape of it, this helmet-like shape, was inspired by the Spanish conquistadors. And this part of um, Bolivia, and in also um, another hat that we just flipped through quickly from Peru, a Montera, um, both have historical, yep, that one, uh, sort of a historical context. Um, the red one that you're looking at on the screen is worn by Quechuan women. And they believe that it, it harkens back to um, the Quechuan are descendants of the Inca empire. And um, they believe that this hat really goes back to the, um, the days of the Inca empire in the 14, 1500s before it was conquered by the Spanish. And they had a, they worshiped a, a sun god called Inti. And they think historians believe that the shape of this hat sort of is a reflection of, um, you know, uh, the sun god. And you can sort of see the, the round shape and then the rays coming out from the hat. So that has a lot of um, historical symbolism. And the, the helmet we were talking about is reminiscent of the Spanish conquistador's helmet um, called a morion, which um, 
you know, anyway, so, something that they would have been familiar with um, that, that again, dates back, what, four or 500 years now. Great. Okay, I think we have time for one more hat and then we'll open it up to questions. Okay. Uh, this is an interesting hat. This is also from Nigeria. It's um, worn by the people in the Yoruban, um, a man's hat um, from the Yoruban tribe. And it's known as um, an Ileori, which I believe translates to a house of the head. And this is a sort of interesting hat in terms of um, reflecting a lot of the religious beliefs of this group of people. And among the Yoruban people, they have a complex religion. Um, and one of the features of the religion is that they sort of honor, almost worship the head. And they believe that a person's head is the embodiment of a person's character, his intellect, his personality, destiny. So, you know, everything we tend to, in our culture, think about, you know, re refer to people's hearts. I think in this community in Africa, they talk about a person's head. And the hat is actually a shrine to the head and is a way of reinforcing um, sort of the sacredness of that part of the body and also a way of honoring that person's God given abilities. So, it also represents the status. The cowrie shells are interesting because cowrie shells, which are all the white pieces on the crown, um, many, for many years were used um, in, across Africa as a currency. So anything that had cowrie shells on it would, again, would be a reflection of a person's, um, basically how much money they had. It's, it would be the equivalent of uh, putting actual money on your head. So it's just a way of kind of representing the person's um, sort of honoring you know, his great fortune in life. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. I know there's so many more hats I would like to bring up, but um, Laura, do you, we have any questions for Stacy from our students or other participants? We do, yeah. Um, so one of the questions we got was, um, you mentioned that some hats have magical qualities. Can mm -hmm. you example of one as well as the story and significance behind it? Uh, the, the one that probably comes to mind is, um, and I don't know, Laura, if you have it on the screen, is a um, hat from China, a child's hat, a little black one with a face. The ah, that one. Yeah. Okay. So that has a lot of, that's, that's a fun one to talk about. This is a hat from China that would have been worn um, it's a, it's a, it's a like baby's hat and it would have been worn maybe a hundred or more years ago. And if you think about it, a hundred years ago, China was a very different country than it is now as it's developed. But, uh, you know, in the 1800s and early um, 20th century, there was a high rate of child mortality in China. And it was not uncommon for a child to die before he or she reached um, his first birthday. So to keep the, you know, people didn't have good sanitation, they didn't have access to health care, they were much more superstitious and so forth, but they would do whatever they could to keep their children safe. And the mothers would make hats with scary faces and, you know, symbols in them as a way of trying to scare evil spirits away. And then all the auspicious symbols would be also added protection for the child to um, often some of the um, hats from China and other parts of um, Asia would be sort of designed to look like flowers and try and fool evil spirits to keep them away from the child. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so then um, another question we got was, are there any hats in the collection uh, or in the exhibition that could potentially be worn more casually the way that they're worn in our culture, like you mentioned, the baseball caps and things like that? Um, there are, you know, not all the hats are ceremonial or used in religious ceremonies or, or you know, for special occasions like that. I do have a number of hats and racking. I'm trying to think of which ones they would be. Um, well, traditionally, the, the Norwegian hats would have just been worn as normal hats to keep a person warm. To, again, today they're worn um, mostly for cel celebrations, ceremonies, parades, or whatever. Um, there's a hat from Africa that would have been worn, I think, pretty typically. It had cowrie shells on it. Um, 
you know, it's, it's hard to tell for me to tell, you know, so much has changed in the world, even in 20 or 25 years since I acquired some of these hats as to whether or not the people still will wear them. The, the hats from Thailand, those, those women's headdresses would be worn for generally everyday occasions. Wow. And they're pretty heavy too. <laughs> yeah. Well, that one in particular is heavy. Yes. But some of that, they're, they're heavy because they have beads and seeds and coins and all kinds of things. Yeah. It's remarkable that, that people would wear them every day, but they do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's pretty amazing. Um, all right. And then another question we received, um, mm -hmm. and I don't know if this might be, feel free to answer it or not. Uh, what's the most that you spent <laughs> on a hat or what was the most valuable hat? Uh, I actually get that question a lot. I think my most, oh boy. Um, you know, I don't really remember. Uh, probably a couple thousand dollars, maybe a few thousand dollars. If it's more than a thousand dollars, I probably pretty much wanted to take that out of my mind and not remember how much I spend on it. Um, but I have a number of hats that are, that are, you know, in the, thousand to maybe, maybe $3,000 range, maybe not even that much. But most of the hats, you know, I started off collecting hats um, because they were inexpensive souvenirs. And for many, many years, I really had no intention of spending money and, you know, investing in the collection. But, but I think with any collection, it, it evolves over time, you know, you get more interested in it, and, and you're, you become more discriminating about what you want. So, um, so yeah, and unfortunately, most of the hats that I want these days are, are very expensive. I can imagine. Mm -hmm. um, so then I think the only other question we have time for uh, is how, how did you pull, like how was this exhibition pulled together? How well, I wrote, I um, had sent a proposal to international arts and artists um, proposing an exhibit around the hats and um, sort of their mission is to bring cultures together. So it, it definitely fit into um, so what, what the kind of work that, that they do. And uh, it, was, it was a collaborative effort. I came up with some proposals. They wanted to cut it down. Um, we went back and forth about how to arrange it, how many categories. And, and again, I feel strongly about representing different parts of the world and not just places that we're not familiar with, but I always like to bring it back to um, a reflection about ourselves um, or you know, sort of an American culture, things that we're familiar with. So um, you know, when we put it together, it was a balance of, um, we had five themes and I wanted, and they also wanted um, an approximate similar number in each of those categories. And I wanted, we wanted a distribution of different countries um, reflected in each of those categories. So it was a lot of, lot of little pieces in the puzzle. Many of the hats I, because of the criteria, I wasn't able to include. Um, so it was, you know, I, I sort of juggled them around from, from one place to another. A little more complicated than I would have imagined it to, it to be by the time it was all said and done. But but one thing that that I, again I feel strongly about is is I don't want people to look at the hats and say, oh my gosh, these things are so weird. I can't believe people really wear them and put them on their heads, uh, because I think if people you know from outside the United States, for instance, look at our headwear, they might think that that what we do is is unusual. Um, or some of the hats that we wear, or, or perhaps the way, I guess I wouldn't say the way we dress, but, um, you know, it's very easy to look and see the differences in other people. But one of the things I want to convey with the hats is that they really represent values that people everywhere around the world share. And, um, you know, for, for me, they're a way of, of getting people to talk about not just our differences, um, but all the things that we have in common in terms of how we express ourselves, the kinds of things that we and people everywhere around the world um, want to say about who we are, you know, the things we value, the things we believe and so forth. So, so that's, that was um, to me a, an important part of putting the, um, the exhibit together. Great, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Stacy. You're welcome. We greatly appreciate it and um, I would like to also thank all of the people who joined us today on Zoom.
And we have um, some more programs. So we'll have three more programs this month that will be starting on March 16th. So please check out our website to um, register for the events related to this exhibition. And thank you again, Stacey, for thank you very providing much. us thank with the opportunity to <laughs> exhibit this. Thank you. It's been great to work with you both. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today.